All right, Paleo Hackers, with me on the other end, Dr. Mark Bubbs, naturopathic doctor, author of The Paleo Project, and you've been hearing him on our calls for the audio cast, which if you aren't listening right now on iTunes, go over and check those out. This one is a video one on YouTube, so we brought him on the show today to talk about men's health. Mark, thanks for coming on, man. Awesome, guys. Glad to be here. How you doing, Clark? Always good to chat. Always good to chat, man. Fantastic. Let's do this. You know, dad bods are in, so I think we can skip the working out part of this and, sure. uh, you know, just, just call it a good a good day. Just get straight to the health. <laughs> well, I know. Uh, the, yeah, the dad bod's a kind of a weird thing. It's like a... I don't know where it started, but that that's the legit craze in Hollywood right now is the out of shape, like beer belly ish not like massive dad bod yeah. but definitely a minor pooch going it's kind of like things sway both ways you know and i think um you know that's definitely i work downtown toronto so we see guys who are working hard uh enjoying life a little bit perhaps a little bit too much and you know the, the abdominal adiposity there the waist circumference tends to, to creep out a little bit so the beer belly is definitely one of those things that uh that can sneak up on you, and for guys, can lead to some uh, some issues if it gets out of control. So guys are getting dad bods, and women are going gray now on purpose. Like it's a uh, yeah, it's a big craze, at least in Washington, Seattle, and stuff. Yeah, people like dyeing their hair gray and all that. But anyway, man, today we're talking <laughs> yes. by, by the title. If if you can't tell, we're talking about men's health, and this is really good. I wanted to bring you back on the show. We're shooting around potential topics, and you mentioned men's health, and you know I lit up because. We normally have women on the show to talk about women's health and PCOS and, you know, uh, the menstrual cycle and uh, all yeah. these all these different methods of birth control. But we don't have anything specifically for men. And um, so it's good today to, to lay down some solid issues. And before we start dumping, jumping into it, um, you know, it's not just for men. It's for women, too, and, and that they can be aware uh, for, the, for the men in their life, just like the men who are listening to the women calls, they can be aware, and it makes you a, a better uh, partner a better uh, person to just understand these things so it's really for everyone for sure and i mean the t- two main reasons why men end up going to the doctor are if one it interferes with their sex life their health and number two if it interferes with their workplace so guys really kind of tend to wait and wait and wait to, to to go in and get checked out most of the time it's because classically they go into their doc they know they're not in the best of shape and they know they're going to get a lecture or are going to get beat on a little bit and yeah. you know so they just end up delaying it um I think that's where the girl, the wives and girlfriends and partners come in because that's normally the ones who are prodding them to, to get their act together and then kind of leads them in. But um, I think, you know, the tides are definitely changing in terms of, you know, guys starting to realize that you don't have to, uh, and in my practice, you know, we don't overhaul people's behaviors right off the bat. I mean, we're just trying to, to tweak things a little bit and, and make things manageable, right? Because uh, I think that's the fear for a lot of guys is you're going to completely change their what they're eating and, and how they're going out or what whatnot and they just that's just too much for them yeah absolutely so men the stereotypical male being the fixer and the solver doesn't want to do too much of the preventative stuff so when you tell him to eat his vegetables every day he's like yeah, yeah yeah i don't have heart disease so it doesn't really apply to me and then one day he wakes up and gets heart disease or gets erectile dysfunction or whatever these issues are and comes that's to dr fair. mark bubs and it's like hey fix this and then once it's fixed it's like okay i'm good i fixed it for sure. I mean, I think that's what the guys tend to. I mean, even vegetable consumption, this is, you know, the irony of even the whole paleo uh, approach is that we always think of the meat and the, the animal protein. But I mean, really, it just you start eating tons of vegetables. And that's the one where the guys start to realize that, uh, you know, especially here, it's barbecue season. Uh, so people are grilling all over the place. And as long as you get those veggies in, it's really kind of a key, key part of that. Because yeah. I mean, realistically, a lot of the guys that I see are, you know, going to be a bit overweight. Again, they, you know, a bit of a beer belly. We know that once the waist gets above 38 inches, all the disease risks start to go up in terms of like hypertension and dyslipidemia, um, risk for cancers, etc. So that's you know, that's the minimum threshold we're trying to work with. Um, and when we see the, the you know, we, if, you, if you've got a beer belly, basically there's a couple things going, that we know are going on from the latest research. One of them is that you're going to have dysbiosis, so you're you're going to have too much of this you know bad bacteria versus the good being you know out of balance. Um, Two is going to be inflammation. We know that there's going to be a significant amount of inflammation there. Um, and three, really, the cortisol receptors, all the stress receptors are around that midsection. So there's going to be stuff going on with cortisol and even blood sugars with the insulin. So those are that's kind of part and parcel. We already know that's going to be the scenario when they come in and just giving them some strategies to, to kind of help sort that out. Okay. So 
to back it up then, what do you think is like the biggest mistake most men are making that you see every day? I'd say number one's breakfast. I mean, it's unfortunate. You see it more in the guys who are maybe 35, 40 plus because they're still in the mindset of being afraid of eggs and being afraid of things like that in the morning. So the breakfasts tend to look like very high on the carbohydrate side, like cereals, mueslis, orange juice, toast, all that kind of stuff. Um, and for the guy who's overweight, that's just like pouring gasoline on that inflammatory fire. They've really got to get the carbs down in the morning. Um, you know, you can have some fruit, but definitely veggies and the meats and the, the fats are kind of key. So, I mean, the eggs are an easy one, you know, things like avocado, even some, some bacon, stuff like that is normally where we try to get guys to start with. But obviously right off the bat, they're worried about cholesterol. They're worried about saturated fat. It kind of, sure. for some people can sort of rock the world a little bit. Before we clear up some of those myths, what's kind of what, what do you see every day? Describe the guy who you're working with. Describe what he's coming into you feeling like. A lot of times the guys, when they actually come in, they they don't have an overt pathology, right? They might get checked out every year by their doc. Their doc says they're, they're good because all their labs are within the normal range. But, you know, they're a little bit overweight. Their doctor probably says to them, you know, your blood pressure is getting a little bit high or cholesterol, all these kind of things. Um, so they're not totally clear on, you know, this idea of coming in to kind of upgrade stuff, you're not sort of totally clear on. But it's funny because in your, you know, in the workplace environment or with, or with their finances, in terms of their investments, people are always trying to stay ahead of the game and, and analyze the trends and whatnot. But yeah. with our health, it kind of just wait and wait and wait. And once we fall off the edge of the cliff and stuff goes wrong, then we try to fix it. But it's, uh, it's a lot harder to fix at that point. For sure. So again, going back to the preventative style stuff, um, yep. more lifestyle fixes and all that. And, and I'm sure on the call we'll dive later into more specific things um, like certain lab tests and hormones and uh, cool. all that stuff. But uh, so, so we identified kind of what you're seeing every day and, and, and uh, some common issues for men. So I guess to start off then, how do you go about approaching a guy who comes into you? Let's say he's feeling... He's got low energy. He's a bit overweight. Um, he doesn't really do too much in his diet or exercise program. He's just a very blank slate, but he's on the slippery soap down. He's declining. He's not as healthy as he wants to be. What would yep. you do with that guy? Where do you start? I mean, that's the benefit, too. I mean, by the time they actually decided to come in to see me, I mean, there's a little bit of initiative there, and that's where you get into these kind of, when we look at, the research around motivation, like when people have these extrinsic motivators, like their doctor's telling them to eat this way or their trainer or whomever else or their partner, their girlfriend, their wife, that only lasts for so long. Like we've got to try to get it around to be an intrinsic motivator where the person's sort of doing it a little bit for themselves and that's when you get a lot of that sort of sticking power. Now I'd say that the guy that you describe as well is, is typically the guy that comes in. Um, the low energy is definitely a, a part of it and it's funny because low libido tends to be a part of it as well but they don't really come out and say that right off the bat. It's more towards the end of the visit start asking about yeah. uh, libido and stuff, and then finally it sort of comes out in terms of, yeah, you know, it's not what it used to be, these kind of things. And it does all sort of tie in uh, part and parcel. So definitely diet, exercise, lifestyle are the real key kind of big rocks, so to speak, in terms of getting guys back squared away. And I'm sure you can sell them too because the low libido is directly influenced by the fuel intake you have and the output you're doing. And if all that's working well, that's going to be working well as um in addition, because I, I was hearing Paul Check talk about it, and he's basically saying, you know, libido or sex drive is your biological force to recreate. And if you're not healthy enough to recreate, why would that even be there? Like, you don't need that if you're trying to survive, you know what I mean? For sure. And, like, on an athletic side of things, when people, when, when athletes start training hard and getting into, like, an overreaching and even into an overtraining, one of the classic signs of overtraining is low libido um, and disinterest there. And that's one where you don't have to actually be training hard like an athlete. You could just be working long days in the office and you're going to get into kind of a similar type thing where just fatigue sets in, you're probably not sleeping well, and then the libido starts to go down. And those are, you know, we often talk about these little lights in the dashboard of your car that, that you know, tell you to fill, you know, top up the gas and change the oil. That's what we're trying to find on the, on the body as well. These little signs that tell you that things aren't working right, but you don't have a full-blown, you know, pathology yet. Okay, awesome. And so with men's health then, it seems like it's hard to go online and read anything that has men's health without hearing testosterone. Testosterone, sure. testosterone, testosterone, testosterone. I mean, describe that. Is it the catch-all? Is it everything? Do you see that as well? Are you, I mean, are you sick of hearing about testosterone in every single men's health article? It's one of those things where it's... Uh it's definitely very important, but the more we start, the more popular it becomes, it, it gets a little bit bastardized in, in, in a sense. I mean, testosterone is critically important, 
Um, not only for, we always think of building lean muscle mass, which is key. It's actually one of the best markers for a man's healthy aging and longevity is the amount of lean muscle mass. So that's critical. It is critical for libido, but people tend to forget it's also extremely important for, for mental health, um, for cardiovascular health, uh, bone health, so all sorts of things as well. So we definitely want to get, the T levels are trending on the decline, um, but the, we tend to use like a bit of a patchwork approach in, in traditional medicine, like they, you know, if testosterone is low, we just slap on a cream or a gel or a pill and just try to raise it back up. Um, instead of asking the question, like, why is it low in the first place? What's going on in this guy's diet or exercise that's causing this, this low testosterone and then all the symptoms that go along with it? One of the calls we did for our article cast on the audio was about uh, testosterone and some tricks and kind of what it was and one-on-one. So not to, not to repeat that call, but kind of set it up for the person who didn't hear about testosterone. Can you kind of talk a little bit about the hormone and kind of how, what it's important for and then how it gets messed up? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the sort of testosterone leaks or the way that it starts to decline, the average guys, again, if you're overweight, if you've got a bit of a beer belly, then, you know, that central adiposity, that central fat increases an enzyme called aromatase, so that starts converting your testosterone into estrogen, so you're losing testosterone there. Um, if you've gained some weight, then likely your blood sugar hormone insulin is, is a little bit too elevated, right, because of the excessive weight gain and carbohydrate intake. So then you start actually producing a weaker form of testosterone. Um, androstenedione, which is sort of taking up the parking spots of the more powerful testosterone. So that's another area where we sort of get these um, these leaks as well. And cortisol also, which is the you know the stress hormone, but also the busy hormone. If you're a busy person, then, then cortisol and even adrenaline are elevated. And cortisol comes from the same building block um, that testosterone does. So if you're if you're producing more cortisol, then you're be producing less testosterone. And you classically see that in endurance athletes. But again busy person um, around the office at home kids the whole the whole bit um, will definitely de- decrease that as well so you got the hormone cascade and if one gets disrupted they all tend to fall like dominoes I mean corny analogy we've heard it before but it's very very true when it comes to hormones yeah I mean they start to snowball in the wrong direction that's sometimes where it's, people can try to make some changes and they feel like the changes are happening slowly or, or not at all even though they've maybe modify things a little bit but that's where getting back to you know for that person then to help correct what's going on with the blood sugars i mean that's where again for most guys it's pretty straightforward in the sense of really reducing that carbohydrate intake like there's just too many breads at lunch too many cereals in the, at breakfast the snacks you know granola bars all sorts of stuff like that and if we can get the fats and the protein back up in there that then we can do a really good job of starting to to flip that switch a little bit and, and get them more in an anabolic uh, scenario so what are so I guess to back it up, what messes it up then is you're saying a lot of carbohydrates primarily? Yeah, I mean, it's the carbohydrates is always a tricky question because we like to view things as black and white. And if somebody's gained too much weight and we say, well, they should adopt a low-carb diet, then sometimes people think, well, everyone should be on a low-carb diet. But basically, if you're holding on to too much weight, likely your blood sugars are elevated and therefore the hormone which controls, which brings those sugars into the cell as insulin is not sensitive it's not efficient so that person's really going to struggle with uh if their carbohydrate intake is is on the higher side so that's one of the reasons why and the the evidence is really clear when we start reducing the carbohydrate intake especially in guys we get nice reductions in blood sugars and insulin improvements in inflammation and blood pressure all sorts of things and the weight just comes off pretty quick so it's uh it's more of a habit-based thing where a lot of guys if they have eggs in the morning even they're, they're worse they're looking for the toast to put the eggs on but you've got to almost convince them that get rid of the toast and just put your eggs on a, on some lettuce or have some tomatoes or whatever you want with that. But that's kind of a big uh, mental leap for some, some people. And then it's different, too, if there's like an athlete or somebody who trains heavily, um, should they be eating and consuming more carbs or higher carbs than just a sedentary kind of person? Yeah, I mean, this is where, as a general rule, the more intense the training, the more it's glycolytic, the more you're going to depend on carbohydrate-driven pathways. Now, there's some cool research coming out showing that we can dramatically reduce the carbohydrate intake during training to become more fat-adapted, um, and that can help us out in the long run. But even in competition, we'd go back to incorporating more carbohydrates. If it was, you know, when push comes to shove and you're actually competing, uh, I work with the men's uh, national basketball team here in Canada, and when we're playing games, I mean, we're making sure that we have carbohydrates available um, in terms of drinks, etc., to keep the guys going. But there's definitely a lot of strategies that guys can use on the athletic side to add the carbs in or out. But in terms of post-training, I mean, you want to replenish those glycogen stores. So sometimes we're getting a little bit scared of carbohydrates, but the fitter, the leaner you are, 
especially post-exercise. I mean, those carbohydrates are being shuttled right into the muscles and topping up those glycogen stores are pretty key. I want to talk again about testosterone, what we were touching on before we got into carbs and kind of how testosterone gets messed up by the carbohydrate intake and the blood sugar roller coaster. But do you think that testosterone is even the best marker of a healthy man or are there other things we should be looking at to kind of determine if you're healthy or not than just testosterone levels? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely quite a few things. I think testosterone is a good place to start. The, the tricky part is, you know, there's different measures. Total testosterone gives you the measure of all the testosterone in the body, which is, you know, 50% of it is bound. So, so that's not the, the sort of true measure. So you always want to be getting bioavailable testosterone, uh, which is the un- that, that available portion and as well as free testosterone. Okay, so those are the ones that will, will give you a better sense of what's going on. Free testosterone is really sensitive to stress and training. So that's kind of a nice one for the athletic population or even the person who's just kind of busy at the workplace. And then that bioavailable testosterone kind of lets you know how much is in the gas tank, so to speak, because we see those levels kind of trending down and that will have a trickle down effect, you know, through the rest of the body. So T levels for sure are good, but I mean, even then, you know, a lipid panel, cholesterol levels, triglycerides, triglycerides are pretty clear. I mean, if you're fit and exercising and eating well, those triglycerides are going to be low. Uh, even in guys who are overweight, and that's kind of the coolest thing, is if you take somebody who's overweight and hasn't been exercising, and all you do is add exercise, most all the disease risks go down dramatically. So it's pretty amazing that just getting in the gym, getting active, just totally corrects a lot of this stuff and, and you know basically buys people a lot of time in terms of getting their weight down. Sure. And so before we get into exercise and fat loss and stuff, while we're talking about testing and all that, is there kind of a comprehensive test the guy listening right now can go and pick up and really get some blood lipid panels, testosterone levels? Is that a pretty standard test? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the tests, depending on the the doc, what would be run through the doctor, but I mean, a lipid panel, HA1C is your three-month average of blood sugars. That's uh, an important one to get run. You know, the normal ranges typically are a little bit wider than what we'd want to see ideally. So, you know, when the doc tells you you're all good, you're in the normal range, that's nice. But you always want to know what your number is um, because there is going to be kind of areas of these ranges that are that are better than others. Uh, CRP is going to be your inflammatory status. So that's your systemic inflammation, which is key as well. So getting that guy run. Uh, vitamin D, we see a lot of really cool stuff coming out now, even in the summertime, especially with athletes. Um, the intensity of the training inflammation can really drive down D levels. So we're seeing... Even in elite athletes in the middle of the summertime, you know, low levels, um, far below the low end of normal with them. So the vitamin D would also be a, an important marker. From there, you can get into a lot of other things, but it's sort of nice, you know, if you're, if you're getting your testosterone, your blood sugars, your lipid panel, your inflammation, vitamin D, you're, you're at least getting a really nice uh, starting point to, to see where you're at. And then you can use those numbers year to year and check in and compare, you know, you to you basically versus just always looking against the normal range. If you could give a guy at home one tip to clean up his diet, just one thing he was going to do for two weeks, that's it, what would you give him? It's tricky. I mean, one of the things I tell a lot of guys is just add something green to your meals in terms of a lot of guys who love to eat, you know, they don't have no problem getting the protein in and the steaks and the chicken and the fish. It's like adding some greens, adding some spinach and some arugula and some kale and some chard and all these types of things. Even just put the, the eggs or the steak on top of it and literally let all that, you know, all the, the taste and the juice and everything kind of run onto the, the greens, and that all sort of wilt it, and you won't really taste it all. But we, it's really cool research coming out of Japan showing that even when you grill something, you know, there's, there's mild uh, damage to the DNA, and that's offset by a lot of the greens that we eat. So getting the greens in is massive. And then number two for the guy who's overweight, just like we said before, is just getting those carbs down. Okay. And so up in your greens, lowering your carbs. What about carbs? Do they have a place in anyone's diet in terms of, like, I know there's different kinds, like fruits versus breads and pastas versus potatoes, starchy ones. Kind of talk about the different kinds of carbs and maybe their role in someone's diet when they would be appropriate. For sure. And I mean, you know, carbohydrates effectively are all your complex carbs, your starchy carbs, like your breads, your rices, your pastas, your potatoes. But it also includes all of your fruit um, as well as your, your vegetables. So that's those are all included in a, in the carbohydrate section. And when we put somebody on, let's say a low carb diet, it's typically defined as hundred grams of carbs or less. Now that's a loose definition because if a guy is consuming 800 grams of carbs a day and you put him on a 300 gram carb diet, effectively that's a low carb diet relative to what he's used to. But that classic definition is about hundred grams of carbs. So for anyone who's trying to really shift their weight and, and cut down, it's just starting by trending away from those starchy carbs, especially sort of the breads and a lot of the grains and stuff like that. 
uh, is a great way to do it because that'll bring that number down pretty quick. What do, what does kind of like a hundred carbs look like? Just so yeah, if you want to think of like a couple pieces of bread, it's going to already get you to about fifty grams of carbs. A banana is about thirty grams of carbs, and apples about twenty five. But when you move into the veggies, I mean, you're getting a whole cucumber for seven or eight grams, or a head of broccoli for eight grams, and hmm. uh, leafy greens are almost negligible. I mean, you can you can eat a boatload of greens without kind of tipping that. So it's it's kind of nice when you give someone hundred grams of carbs to quote unquote spend for the day because it directs them. They can eat more food if they choose veggies and less food if they move towards the um, towards the starchy stuff. But when we look at the research again, there's there's studies that show with uncolo- uncontrolled caloric intake on a low carb diet versus calorically controlled low fat diets, they're seeing you know better um, weight loss as well as health parameters. So it's 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 kind of cool when you can just make things easy for guys like you know don't count calories don't you don't have to go around tracking everything you're eating just focus on one thing let's just get the carbs down you know eat as much protein and fat and veggies as you want and then that way it kind of simplifies things and then as you move forward you can kind of tweak it a little bit and get more in depth in terms of what you want them to do okay so you would recommend adding leafy greens in because they're almost negligible in terms of calories in terms of carbs i mean they're pretty much just pure vitamins and minerals those are good add them in put some meat on them get the low car uh, semi low carb you know 100 grams or whatever to spend for the day and really concentrate on that and those will fix a lot of the common problems we're seeing in guys for sure, and the nice part, fill up on the proteins, and you can add some fruit in there as well. You know, the berries are a great option, great for blood sugars, great for inflammation. Um, and just don't be surprised if you're someone who's been, you know, eating a carb-based diet. In those first few days, you might get a little bit of low energy, you might get a bit of irritability. That's that's normal, right? You just want to be able to, uh, you know, if it's too severe for you and you can't get your work done, then obviously you can titrate up a little bit. But that's that's a normal response, and what will happen in the, in the two or three or four days, just like if you if you stop drinking coffee, your, your body's going to adapt to that and become um, better able to manage its blood sugars on its own rather than just relying on the food that's coming in. Because uh, the carbs just make you crave more carbs, and that's the guy who's sitting at his desk and just ate breakfast, and mid-morning he's snacking, and before lunch he's snacking, and all through the afternoon. Gotta love coffee, man. I'm drinking some right now. This is uh, <laughs> this is the mushroom coffee my man Taro gave me who came on the show. Oh, awesome. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, How, how's it tasting? You know, it's good. It's like an earthy taste. And they use an instant coffee, which I think is organic. So that's good because that's a really heavily cool. sprayed crop. Um, but they grind grind up like, I think, quarter set mushrooms, maybe some chaga and some reishi and stuff. And it gives oh, it fantastic. kind of like that, yeah, that really earthy uh, flavor. Four Sigma Foods is the brand. And um, cool. that kind of stuff is great for men as well. These, uh, you know, adaptogens and. Uh, nootropics and stuff like that are really good for supporting stress response and, uh, and immunity and stuff like that. So that's always a nice option for guys. So I wanted to ask you while we're transitioning, sounds like into kind of supplements for men. Um, and that's, you know, already a billion dollar industry on its own. And you, you go into any supplement store and you just see, you know, Century for men and multivitamins for men. And it yeah. might be kind of a marketing tactic, but are there any other before we even talk about specific supplements, are there any other things that guys need more of than women would need? Uh, in terms of the like micronutrients, like vitamins, minerals, and things like that? Yeah, or? yeah. in terms of like, like zinc or magnesium or any of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, um, you know, this is where, you know, typically when you read articles about supplements or in the newspaper, it's always about a multivitamin. And multivitamins can definitely be beneficial, but I mean, if you're eating a, you know, a good diet, especially one if it's a sort of a paleo-based diet, it's really nutrient-dense, all the meats and the veggies and some fruit are going to really top up a lot of those numbers. So this is where when we talk even supplements with guys, the multivitamin can be nice, but if you are eating that diet, you might be doubling up on a lot of the stuff that you're getting there. So finding the, the key areas that might be low for men is, is pretty critical. And one of the ones, I mean, you hit it right on the head there, is, is zinc, um, you know, alcohol consumption, especially even beer consumption with the phytates there can, add, can start to... In. Yeah, well, it, those foods and alcohols just decrease your zinc levels. Uh, being busy as well does it, it poor immunity, all that type of stuff. So for guys, getting the zinc levels up is pretty key. So that can be a nice supplement to uh, to add in. Um, and again, four, eight, twelve weeks, kind of add it in and then take it out again because you know the foods, the, the best food to have for for zinc levels are oysters. So I mean, if you're a fan of uh, shellfish, go for it. Yeah. Okay. And so there's no kind of must-have supplements. That's all somewhat marketing is what i'm hearing the biggest yeah i mean the biggest thing around around supplements is that we you know a lot of times the promotion of them is pretty amazing with the marketing and the, and the buzz and everything else 
But at the end of the day, I mean, the foods that you're eating and the training that you do in terms of the exercise are going to be the best ways to get your testosterone levels up. If they're really stagnant and you've tried for eight weeks, 24 weeks, whatever it's been, um, to try to get those up and they're not budging, that's when you know medications can be useful. But when you're using supplements, you can do it, but just make sure it's just going to be a nice add-on to your program versus if you're just taking the supplement and you've changed nothing else in your, your diet, exercise, or lifestyle, then it's, it's likely not going to have too much of an effect. Magic pill, yeah. And yeah, no magic pills. Yeah, no magic pills, and uh, that sucks to hear, but it, it is true. It's <laughs> phenomenal when you, when you think about that 95 99% of... Uh, what you want, whether it be results with like muscle mass or better energy, better libido, uh, more mental clarity, better mood, all come from the stuff that's the simplest, diet, exercise, and rest. And when you start getting yeah, that in line, boom, 99% right there. There you go. It's tough to market that stuff, right? Like it's, uh, you're not going to make a lot of money marketing that stuff. But I mean, one of the classic examples I see with guys, especially bigger guys, is we say, okay, we want you to start lifting and we want you to start doing squats and deadlifts and you know, you know, lunges or Olympic lifts maybe. And they always say, well, look, I'm already big. I don't want to. I don't need bigger legs or stronger legs. And they don't make this connection that all these lower body dominant exercises are the ones that are really kicking up the testosterone levels of men um, and and women as well to a smaller degree, but an important degree for women. But um, that's critical. So it's if the guys aren't putting that in their program, even if the you know the heavier the guy is, I mean body weight squats. If you're 250, 300 pounds, I mean it's going to be uh, some work as well. So those are the ones that definitely have to be in the program every single day that you're in the gym or, or training. Um, and I recommend at least if you're trying to boost T levels three or four times a week to, to get in there and, and and do some of those things. Before we start getting into exercise, um, cool. let's let's touch back on supplements. With yep. that, is there anything? Supplements are fun. Right, and people like sure. supplements. They're fun to go to the store and pick out a new one to research it. It's kind of like a little hobby, you know. And you, yeah. you might as well, if it makes you feel better or healthier, get some effect. Is there any that some guys could be experimenting with right now that you would recommend? For sure. I mean, the ones that we tend to use that are are, are pretty nice. Uh, Tribulus is a great uh, herb. Um, just make sure you know the, the form from Bulgaria is really where you're getting all the the real um, key nutrients in there that are going to help to to upregulate things. So. What, uh, what is that tribulus? Is it a tribulus? Root? Is a herb? Yeah, uh, it's a herb that helps to up, helps to boost uh, 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 luteinizing hormone levels um, and, and DHEA levels. It influences those, which helps with testosterone. So we tend yeah. to to dose those uh, in the evening and uh, sometimes in the morning for guys. So that can be a nice addition. Uh, typically, is one of the ones included in a lot of the men's. Uh, you know some of those tester booster formulas. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's that's where I was hearing it because I, I heard yeah. it was like in that realm of like the HGH supplement, you know, the mimicker or whatever. Like not not the actual obvious steroid version, but like you know it sure. was marketed in the bodybuilding community as kind of like the HGH booster tribulus. For sure, and some of those even when they have those, they'll have those on like amino acids like arginine. But the dose you actually have to take to get up there is just a massive dose. You don't almost have to take the whole bottle at once. So it's, it's just sort of a, a little bit of misleading kind of marketing there. But the other yeah. herb that's great is Indian ginseng. Ashwagandha so is great. It can influence testosterone levels as well. Great okay. to take before bed. Um, kind of that 300 to 600 milligram range. So those can be really nice. Um, I thought guys ginseng, were, ginseng was really like get you wired. So you wouldn't want to take that before bed. It, uh, there's different types of ginseng. So it gets a little confusing. Like a Korean ginseng is the red ginseng. And that's the one that sort of gets you wired. That's the one that's in you know, sport drinks and other things that kind of jacks people up. Yeah. Um, but the uh, ashwagandha is different. It, it, it's sort of a, it's supportive. It helps to build guys back up, but it doesn't, uh, it's not stimulatory in any way. It actually helps to kind of relax. Hmm. Um, so it's, it's nice to take um, at bedtime for sure. Um, what about maca? You heard anything about maca? Yeah, I mean, maca is definitely a nice herb. It's like a lot of things where, you know, it gets, becomes sort of super popular and a bit, you know, its benefits for tea levels kind of get, a bit overblown, but it's a nice one to add in. That one's more in the morning, maca, even the rhodiola. Um, it's really great studies for rhodiola, even you know, back in the days of the, the Soviet Union, but even with a lot of athletes, and I know even Olympic athletes, when they're training intensely, that's one of their go-tos. So that would be a pretty cool one to throw in in the morning. Um, and you can you can adjust your dosing a little bit, you know, start with a couple hundred milligrams of the rhodiola and then just start bumping it up. Um, but those can be really great because they help to improve your work capacity. So they just help your body cope more with being busy and stress levels and whatnot. I can't take mock anymore. I um, in college I was studying all these supplements and looking for the magic pill, yeah. and so yeah. I bought this. You know, I loved maca and tried it. Bought a little bit at Whole Foods and then um, decided to order a five-pound bag of it, like this massive shrink wrap <laughs> package bag. Kind of looked like I had a 
five pound bag of cocaine that you stick a knife in and test it. Uh, anyway, it was sitting in my dorm room, just on a, just on a bench there. It's a five pound bag of maca, and I'd, I'd take it every morning. I'd take it. It just has that really malty, bitter flavor. Yeah. And I even tried making like ice cream with it. I mean, I got weird with the stuff, but uh, it got to the point now of every time I taste it. I just, I, I get that almost gag reflex or, you know, I just smell it. It's like, oh, don't want to touch that again. Yeah, that can happen when you kind of over, go overboard with one certain thing. But, um, yeah, those, those are all those herbs are nice to add in. Just kind of rotate them a little bit, maybe four weeks, eight weeks, and then switch it up a little bit because your body, either the dosing or the herb, because your body does become sort of adapted to that to that stimulus. So that's typically where people get some benefit as well. Any herbs, supplements that get too much credit that you kind of roll your eyes when you hear about that? Um, I think just the, in terms of the testosterone creams and gels is kind of the big one. I mean, we tend to just go straight to the medications. And the funny part is we get to these massive doses that the docs are giving these guys. And so for the first eight, four or eight weeks, they feel like superheroes. I mean, they just think this is the greatest thing ever. They think that they found the magic pill. Yeah. you know. And then after that, because they've had such a high dose, I mean, their symptoms start to worsen, uh, mood, uh, libido, and everything else. And so now it's a slippery slope because they've either got to really jack up their intake even higher, which can get, uh, you know, can be quite unhealthy um, because they downregulated those receptors. So it's, that's a really tricky one because you get this immediate bang for your buck and you're feeling great, and then all of a sudden you're going to hit a wall at that kind of eight to twelve week mark, and it's going to you're going to really struggle. So I'd say for most guys, the slow and steady approach is going to be the best way because once you nail the best program for yourself, then you're going to be able to kind of maintain it. And if you can get some testing done, especially if you're using any gels or creams or whatnot, make sure you get some baseline testing so you know kind of where things stand. Okay, so the guy who's going to his doctor complaining and, and they test him, he's got low T instead of fixing up more diet lifestyle stuff, boom, they give him a cream, he puts it on, he feels like a superhero for 8 to 12 weeks, and then you're saying he you adap- adapts to it and then it starts to go back down. Yeah, because the dose is just super physiological in a sense. It's way too much. So all the testosterone receptors start to downregulate in the body, and then that's where you're not going to get the response anymore. And the guy might actually feel worse after 8 or 12 weeks than he did even at the start when he came in complaining of his problems. So that's where, you know, it's, it's fine to definitely use, like we use supplements as well and medications in the right scenario, but just make sure you're always, there should always be a diet and exercise component, absolutely. And even a lot of the lifestyle stuff and breathing and sleep are just critical as well because... Once you nail those, then you're going to be you're going to be dialing in some good levels from now and five years from now and ten years from now versus just kind of having this immediate buzz and then falling off the edge of the cliff. I've heard testosterone and other hormones, be, or mostly testosterone, be called the youth hormone. And for guys, you know, anti aging, you know, it's so great, preserve lean muscle mass, lose fat. What do you think of bioidentical hormones and them being prescribed as kind of like the youth hormone or stay young or just in, in general uh, kind of supplementing with bioidentical hormones up to baseline? Yeah, and that's where it's kind of dovetailing when we chatted about. I mean, that's where the, typically we see some doses that are just too high. I mean, we're, we're coming in with these really initial big doses of whether it's testosterone or women, progesterone, or estrogen. Um, when we're talking guys with the testosterone levels with the bioidenticals are just can be too elevated. And so those levels get up pretty quick. Um, so just a slower, steadier approach, making sure, yeah, as long as you're working within that window of um, that reference range there and not getting too much above for that, the high end of normal um, is kind of the key, the key take on there. And, and just uh, you can't beat moving for, for, for improving T-levels. I mean, bending down, standing back up, squats, deadlifts, all that stuff is just the, the absolute home run. When you look at the research, T-levels go up pretty quick. Uh, one of the reasons why guys who train a lot, I mean, I know for my clients who are 40, 50, 60 plus, I mean, one of the biggest things they come in t- talking about when they start training and some of my clients didn't even start lifting until they were 60 and they just on the libido side of things, it's an absolute game changer. I mean, that's yeah. half of them. I don't even think enjoy training that much. They just want the libido effects and they come in and knock it out for half an hour, an hour. Right. So that's, that's sort of the magic pill. If you want to, if you want to call it that. Yeah, for sure. And, uh- I mean, okay, so do bioidenticals have a role um, for anyone? Because I know even even within, like, the paleo community, I've heard some talks about people getting their levels checked when they were, I don't know, 20 or 30, and then they slowly decline over age, even with, like, proper diet and nutrition. I mean, is that just aging and we should let it happen, or is it okay to kind of supplement back up to the levels you were at when you were 20 and 30 if you knew those numbers? I mean, it's a bit tricky because you got to make sure you're with a skilled practitioner because if you're training intensely, then we're naturally going to see declines in testosterone. And then when you come off your training and you rest, the levels should sort of come back. So there's this mm. transient nature to things. So sometimes, you know, even with cortisol or stress hormones, 
people start testing now and they want to have these perfect numbers kind of all the time. And that's, that's not really how the body works. So just making sure that you're testing at the appropriate times, um, you know, setting some benchmarks. And then at the end of the day, I mean, it's not necessarily that you have to have the same levels as if you're 20, but we got to figure out why your levels are low. Like if you're just overweight and out of shape and you've got the beer belly and the blood sugars are off and there's inflammation and stress, then those are the big things. If we fix that, your T levels are going to come back right. um, to where they should be. Right. Um, but just remember the, those bioidenticals are the kind of the heaviest hitter. So let's go through kind of the, you know, the diet exercise, the supplements, then you get up to your medications, which is kind of the heaviest hitter there. And that's uh, as long as you work along that sort of spectrum, you'll be all right. But the problems come when you just jump straight into the supplements or rather the bioidenticals and guys don't want to do any of the other, uh, the other stuff, right? The quick fix. Yeah. It's the, I mean, it's the fixer and the solver that comes back, even myself included, you know, supplements or with uh, magic pills or whatever you want to call it. So I totally get how guys... They hear about testosterone, boom, they go to their doctor, they get a cream, and it feels awesome, so that reinforces that magic pill, that quick fix mentality, and then as yeah. soon as what we're talking about, it wears off, they're like, where's the next one, you know? That's all I needed was that thing, and now it's not working, so there must be another thing that works, and I can fix and solve. It doesn't work like that, man. Go back. For sure, and there's some cool stuff coming out about, yeah, about titrating these levels up to the higher ends of normal and how that can impact, you know, mood and cardiovascular health and all these kind of things, so... You know, as guys get older, as long as you've just measured it for a little while, just try not to jump in right away. But if you've if you've done your due diligence and you've done your training, you're eating well, and you still notice you're kind of hovering around that that middle range, and you you still feel like you get some benefit, then then talk to your doc. But always start with really low dosing, and then work up from there. Because if you go high, then you get the quick benefit, and then after that, you're definitely gonna to struggle at some point. How you doing on time, Mark? You got an extra ten minutes? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. Okay, cool. I just wanted to hit on. Um sexual health and stuff i mean it's a big issue yep. when you're talking especially men specific stuff we normally go like 45 minutes but i want to tack on an extra 10 for the guys listening right now uh wondering when they were going to talk about getting it on and stuff so I, I know it's you know erectile dysfunction is a humongous problem for guys getting up staying up i mean it's it's right up there i think it's one of the most you said earlier the most uh frequent thing you hear from guys who come in to see you and it's yeah. always at the end and they kind of whisper it in your ear and they're like okay well i'm, I'm having trouble with this little thing right it's, here it's, it's the last thing before yeah. they exit the door it's like oh by the way doc you know been having trouble getting it up or i have yeah. um, you know my libido is low stuff like that so it's uh, it's pretty it's really common and it's uh, you know the busier you are the higher stress levels are it's going to impact you know if you think of nature if you're running away from a lion or a bear you're not really in a procreative state the body's right. just trying to struggle to hang on um so that's where we see a lot of uh, a lot of issues and the guys tend to some of the guys will jump straight into the, the medications which you know which can help but even a lot of these medications started out as uh, you know asthma medications and one of the uh you like, know, one like of the side viagra and siagra and all, yeah. all cialis and all that stuff and so, so because they're, they're you know vasodilators so you get this effect of um you know one of the side effects was obviously you know long-term erection so they thought okay well, let's let's remarket this and then uh okay. we took the cash in but uh they have their place but that's where you know straight off there's some things that you can use like amino acids that will help in terms of blood flow so things like arginine which is great for your heart but also helps um you know you can start with 500 milligrams to a thousand milligrams uh, and even work your way up in terms of health benefits for guys with high blood pressure we go up to six grams a day hmm. and divide it up so that's one that can definitely be a, a big help um, Before we start getting into that, let's still let's yeah. let's talk about uh, you know erectile dysfunction and stuff. There's there's tons of things that would cause it. We mentioned stress yeah. is one of them. Running from a bear, don't have time to procreate. What are kind of some of the other things that would cause erectile dysfunction? Either getting it up or staying up. So definitely lack of sleep is a big one. Um, definitely blood sugar imbalances. Blood sugars being too high. So again, we get back to that sort of carbohydrate. With the, you know, if you've got the beer belly, overweight, then that'll be a, a big one as well. Um, any, the mental aspect is huge as well because if you have a busy job or if you're over caffeinated and, and whatnot, you know, the brain can be working overtime and that mental component is massive in terms of uh, affecting libido and uh, you know, the, the quality of the erection and the quantity of the erection because one of the metrics that we use for kind of seeing how people are doing in terms of recovery is like kind of waking up and that, that morning uh, erection is one way to let yourself know that you know, you're getting into some deep sleep um, and the body's really recharging well. Okay, so the morning erection is a good sign of uh, sexual health and even even testosterone levels and just health in general. And so yeah. I, I, I read online that it should be somewhere like three to four times a week if you're waking up solid 
uh, like that's a good sign you're you're healthy and you're good to go is it because it's not every single day is it? <laughs> for sure it's not every morning so definitely uh you know i'd say two or three times a week you know three being a good measure um that's always a good uh, reference point because uh, again we're looking for these little symptoms and these little signs all the time so if you start noticing that declining if you start noticing you know the fatigue in the morning when you first wake up you know do you struggle to get out of bed do you, are you hitting snooze all the time are you desperately looking for your coffee that'll let you know that on the sleep side of things you're likely not getting you know perhaps it's not enough hours or perhaps it's just not enough deep sleep so okay. you know, and, start, so, you know, make- and so before we start jumping into like you know the vasodilators you were saying that all these medications for erectile dysfunction whether it be you know the big ones like Viagra Cialis or maybe some drugstore mini mart little back blue package little <laughs> two magic pills in there for for whatever 299 um, those started as asthma medications well the, the big ones did the major pharmaceuticals did and then that was one of the side effects was uh, you know erections so they yeah. quickly quickly shifted their uh, marketing strategy and obviously it's uh, it's paid off so they have a place for guys again it's like it's the heaviest hitter it's the thing that you should be going to uh, when you need it and then if you're always having to rely on those things then there's definitely some dysfunction going on so let's try to figure out what that root cause is what's going on is it your blood sugar is it because you're overweight is your tea lo- are your T levels low uh, you're not sleeping well um, is the mental stress kicking in because those will be the real root causes of what's going on uh, so it's nice to have things like the Viagra and the Cialis if you need it. You know, obviously, when the, if the moment arises and you've you got to have some help, then there you go. But uh, if you're using that every single time and it's been years, then it's time to figure out a better, uh, find, better thing. Yeah. Find yourself on a cliff in two bathtubs holding hands with butterflies flying <laughs> like the commercials or whatever. There you go. Yeah, I was thinking about how they got those bathtubs up there. <laughs> it's, it's incredible, isn't it? It's, it's amazing. Oh, it listening? sold me. sold me. I want the bathtub. <laughs> yeah, man. Okay, so then in terms of like supplements, is there anything we could do? You mentioned arginine or something, six six grams or whatever? Yeah, I mean, you can start with, um, you know, anywhere from one, go up to three, and then up to six grams um, of arginine. It's a good, it's a big old dose, but it's uh, highly effective for reducing blood pressure. We tend to see people with poor blood flow have difficulty with uh, erections or quality of erections. So again, that comes back to the guy who's a little bit overweight. Um, so that can be a nice way and you know they're amino acids they're building blocks of proteins one of the reasons why just getting more protein into a guy's diet will be a, a big fix as well but that can be a nice way you know they can add it into their protein shake in the morning they can just stir it up into some water you know three, gram, three grams in the morning three grams at night and that will be a big uh, big help so I know um, touching on more disease risks especially for men prostate cancer and testicular cancer are, are huge and those affect a lot of guys I think in ter- I was looking online before this um, I, I, I read that it was prostate cancer was right behind lung cancer for the leading cause in cancer deaths of men in America I mean it's a big thing affects a lot of guys and then I also heard if you live past I think it's 90 there's a 90% chance that you'll get prostate cancer or testicular cancer or something massive like that so it does affect a lot of people it's, it's, it's out there um what's going on with that yeah i mean there's two different things i mean testicular cancer tends to actually affect more younger guys so in that kind of late 20s to mid 30s uh is sort of an area where that can crop up um and in terms of the, the prostate cancer one is is it's a little bit controversial in the sense of how we of how we test for these things like PSA has been a measure that we typically use although now they're saying well it's perhaps not the most accurate one um, you know doing um, invasive biopsies and whatnot are now not being recommended because that can contribute to the spread so it's one of these things where now we're seeing you know more of a wait and see approach so you're right in the sense of as guys get older that would be one of the main uh, leading risk factors the cool part is you know lung cancer there's the treatments success rate is, is very low, obviously. So lung cancer is a deadly cancer. The nice part with prostate cancer, is the, in terms of the treatment success, is, is, is very good. Um, but again, anytime we're getting into tissues that are replicating or over-replicating, we're seeing some really good evidence with higher insulin levels being strongly associated with cancers because hmm. insulin tells your body to, to replicate and build stuff. So if you're exercising well and training and eating well, you'll build muscle. Uh, if you're not, you'll build body fat. If you're... If you're um, um, stagnant and sitting around and of course it just tells cells to replicate more quickly if, if insulin levels are elevated and that will contribute to, to any types of cancers because the more quickly your cells replicate the, the more 
your body has to put out all the little fires in the sense of all those precancerous cells, your immune system's trying to put those out and is putting those out all the time. But if insulin's elevated, then there's more of those little fires to put out. Okay. So break that down again real quick for guys. So when the cancer is replicating over and over, that's directly correlated to an insulin intake level? So not directly correlated, associated. So the biggest thing for guys, again, is this idea that you know if you're overweight, if you're out of shape, then we really got to get down to kind of bringing those carbohydrate intake down so we can get better blood sugar and insulin function. That's going to really dramatically reduce your risk factors for things like uh, cancers and prostate cancer. So just getting back to kind of the breakfast is number one. Let's pull those carbs down, get the proteins and the fats up. And then throughout the rest of the day, you know, titrating down the amount of carbs, boosting up the amount of proteins and fats. And as you get leaner, you can probably start bringing some more back in, but that'll be the biggest way to sort of protect yourself um, because the blood sugars and insulin are really going to be strongly associated now with um, you know, risks for cancers. So I'm sure there's a lot of like family history that plays into it too. And, and I mean, there's only so much you can do in terms of um, preventing these kinds of cancers. And I guess the biggest one, regardless of family history, because you can't fix that. It's not like you can go back and fix your, your family's history of cancer, but to prevent it through the diet and exercise and all that stuff. Yeah, and I mean, 85%, all the major medical journals tell us that 85% of all diseases, chronic diseases, including cancers, are diet, exercise, and lifestyle. When we talk genetics, we're talking 10 to 12, maybe 15%. So it's really on the short end of the stick on that side. So people do have a, a big capacity to, to support themselves. Obviously, you know, if you if you're in that unlucky ten to fifteen percent, and then there are, you know you do the best you can, but um, you, you should still try. You know, even if even if it's only like a ten percent chance. I mean, you should you still want to influence that ten percent or whatever. But that's cool to hear sure. that like for the guys, because even floating around with the disease and the cancer especially seems to just be linked to family history in in the mainstream. Like you just think of cancer, you think of if your family had it, you're gonna get it. And sure. to hear that it's more like eighty five percent of what you do in your lifetime that determines it, I think is a really empowering thing for people to hear. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, just having people play an active role in their health and for guys, it's all of you, just that small, slow, steady approach of just making some small tweaks. What happens is guys realize that the buy-in is really small. They're not changing that much stuff. All of a sudden they feel better. They're starting to look better. Um, Libido is improving all the health parameters and stuff like that. And then now all of a sudden now we've got some momentum going in the right direction. And then guys are ready to actually, you know, they start coming back to me saying, okay, well, what's the next step? What's the next step? Versus in that initial visit, you know, trying to prod them a little bit to kind of get going. It's, uh, yeah. It's so you add in the simple stuff, build on some wins, and then add more and more and more and more until they pretty much make a lot of changes. And that's the thing. You look back, you know, after four months or six months or a year, and, I mean, people have changed just dramatic amounts of stuff. And it's uh, all those little things are just, they add up to major wins in the long run. Um, it's just tough because the average person tends to beat themselves up over the 10% of stuff they didn't do well and they don't pat themselves on the back enough for the 90% of stuff that they changed you know yeah, yeah, it's a big one super true um, before we move past that and start I guess wrapping it up it's, it's time um, are you a fan of like self tests for prostate cancer testicular cancer I know there's some you can do or how, how should we go about uh, looking for the warning signs of, of what to look out for I mean definitely you know Checking in with your doc annually, I mean, that's where, in terms of pathologies and then screening for disease conditions and whatnot, I mean, your your, your doctors are going to be your best bet there. So going in, get the test done, get screened is key. I'd say where sometimes the functional docs kind of jump in, um, naturopaths, etc., is on that side where the person doesn't have a pathology or they don't have a disease, but they're just not feeling their best. Uh, they want to improve and upgrade, and that's where we can then get into kind of, uh, you know, hacking your health, so to speak, or getting those lab ranges and figuring out what the best area is. But in terms of just overt diseases, going in, getting your test run is, is, is the best place to start. Awesome, man. Well, um, I know you have a book out. Tell us, tell listeners, you know, we're up on time. Tell our listeners kind of where they can find that and, and more about you. For sure, yeah. I mean, the, the book's called The Paleo Project. came out in March. Uh, it's been going great. There's a lot of stuff there. We chatted today about the you know, dysbiosis there, the digestion, the inflammation, these hormones. So there's chapters on all those things. Check it out, paleoprojectbook.com. It's got some nice testimonials on there as well. And then you can also reach me on Twitter at Dr. Bubs, or my website is drbubs.com. Awesome, man. And you got those article casts we did on the iTunes feed, so make sure Absolutely. you guys check yeah, so those check, out. Absolutely. Check those out. We talked all about uh, testosterone and cortisol and uh, salt and all sorts of good stuff. So uh, jump into those. 
Well, awesome, Mark. That was a fun one, man. Thanks for coming on. Really important stuff. I know it gets oversimplified with men's health equals testosterone and fix that, and then it's good. But it's so sure. it's good to get the backstory and dive into kind of some more preventative stuff we can do on the day to day. Beauty. Awesome, man. Thanks a lot for having me, bud.